my name is Hansel Panu. I'm the CFO of Shark International Systems Inc., commonly referred to as Shark Energy. And uh, we are the pioneers of wastewater energy exchange. Wastewater energy exchange is the concept of exchanging thermal energy with wastewater. And this is no different than uh, what you see in the marketplace today with geothermal systems or air source systems. Um, geothermal systems use the ground to exchange thermal energy. Uh, air source systems use the air and we use wastewater. Um, we are the only publicly traded uh, a wastewater energy exchange company in the world. Um, we are uh, Canadian patented with uh, patent pending internationally and um, we are really excited about uh, what we're doing in the marketplace. Um, so when you look at uh, the amount of uh, thermal energy that's used in wastewater, uh, or sorry, in, in um, domestic hot water, um, there's a tremendous amount of waste. How much waste, do you say? Well, about 1.25 trillion liters of wastewater um, that's heated about 20 degrees Celsius is dumped down the drain every day. And there's a gentleman earlier here today that was on the panel um, mentioning about BTUs and the whole conversion and energy and whatnot. So he made me sharpen my pencil and, and review what, uh, what I had in my presentation. But um, so in that 1.25 uh, trillion um, liters of wastewater, uh, there's about two and a half trillion BTUs of energy, which is the equivalent to about 427,000 barrels of energy. So um, you can imagine how much thermal capacity there is uh, worldwide that we can tap into for the purposes of low carbon heating and um, hot water production, as well as um, fresh water saving cooling. Um, so with this, uh, this is just a, a diagram here um, showcasing how we affect uh, the cooling process. Um, so typically in cooling processes, which is becoming, you know, especially here in BC, one of the, if not the, uh, the largest load or one of the largest loads, the largest load that we're seeing in buildings is um, air conditioning. And with air conditioning, hydronic systems, um, this industry standard right now is uh, with hydronic systems is to use a, um, a wastewater holding, or sorry, uh, cooling towers that are on the on the rooftop and they use an uh, enormous amount of fresh water um, whereas our system effectively can uh, dissipate any excess energy in, in hydronic systems into the sewer for the purpose of then recapturing it and using it for your um, hot water load or your space heating so we really can tie in both your cooling and your heating load and um, and it's uh, it's a great way to uh, do that efficiently and effectively We've got two commercialized products. On the left here, I have the Piranha. On the far right, I have the Shark. Uh, the Piranha is an all-in-one wastewater heat pump. Um, so effectively, we put this into, uh, into multifamily buildings, into uh, light commercial, like um, commercial laundry, um, breweries, hospitality. Um, and what this does is before uh, wastewater exits uh, a building, we capture it into what we call a um, wastewater holding tank or a thermal energy storage system, uh, commonly referred to as TEZ. And what we do is that we manage that thermal energy, that's, uh, or that thermal energy battery, so to speak, and we pump that through the system to manage the peaks and valleys of energy usage throughout the year. And so we can do this off-peak, we can do this um, efficiently, and with wastewater, it's remarkably consistent. I, compare, I mentioned geothermal, I mentioned air source. Um, those are using uh, thermal mediums that are you know, susceptible to environment. Um, whereas wastewater is remarkably consistent year-round. It's always in that, what I call Goldilocks range, 15 degrees C to about 35 degrees C. So it uh, creates um, year-round efficiency, a COP of three on average. Um, some installations we're seeing up to eight COP. So uh, what that means is for every $1 of uh, electricity or energy that you're putting in, you're outputting the equivalent of about $8 at in the best case scenario. So these efficiencies are phenomenal. They're industry leading. Um, air source somewhere sits at somewhere around 2.4. Um, so we are, uh, you know, the industry standard when it comes to um, our COP. Uh, the shark system over there, it's our larger uh, industrial uh, size filtration system and energy exchange system. Um, this one, it can handle volumes of wastewater from 250 gallons per minute all the way up to 2,500 gallons per minute. Um, a small skid can do about tw uh, 25 megawatt system, or a point, or sorry, a quarter megawatt, and all the way up to four megawatts of thermal energy exchange. 
So uh, since, since I've started with the company, I started about six years ago. Um, we've, been, uh, we've been dealing with convertible debt on our books. Um, we've, we had a diluted cap table for, uh, that was you know, far exceeding our um, outstanding shares. But over the last uh, six months, we've done a lot of work, cleaned up our balance sheet, um, exercised a lot of outstanding warrants. So um, since the beginning of the year, we've had a working capital gain of about $7.4 million. Um, and we've also injected about $3 million cash into the, into the company. So we're cashed up. Um, we've got you know healthy balance sheet, uh, positive working capital, and we've got a robust pipeline that's you know exponentially growing every day. Um, this is, uh, if you notice, I have some asterisks on the sales pipeline, sales order backlog. You refer to our uh, CDAR filings for what those definitively mean, but effectively, sales pipeline is projects that we have visibility into that we can see that are in design. Um, sales order backlog are systems that are in, um, uh, that we have under contract currently. So over the next six months, uh, pay attention to how many of that, how much of that sales pipeline we convert to sales order backlog. I think it's gonna be um, substantial and I think that's really gonna set the stage for uh, cash flow positive next year. Um, we're really excited about um, the inroads we've made and, and quite frankly, uh, when it comes down to this, you know, the design pipeline comes with its own degree of risks. We can be designed out, we can be value engineered out of, uh, out of systems, but we haven't seen that so much. What I have started to see is that there's a lot of jobs that are out there in the industry and, you know, being developed without us having much visibility or knowledge of. And so, um, on one hand, it's a blessing. On the other hand, it's a burden um, in the sense that I I do my best to let the market know, hey, this is where, where I feel I can tell you that our pipeline's at, but I think it's very likely that that's understated rather than overstated. Um, so I'm really excited about the next year and, and what we can um, showcase here. And then cut it out. Oh, and I guess I did cut it out, sorry. And just to uh, finish off, so we're, we're operating currently in five key markets, um, Washington State, British Columbia, Colorado, Ontario, New York, robust policy, robust incentives. Uh, some markets obviously have way more robust policy and incentives promoting um, the market adoption of technologies like ours, um, namely New York and Washington State, changing building codes and things like that. Um, very quick to finish off, uh, you, may not, you may have heard of us um, being in about, uh, there's about eight installations in the lower mainland of the shark system for the piranha um, for the shark system we're actually currently in uh, the city of Vancouver a neighborhood energy utility um, helping that system it's heating six and a half million square feet of uh, residential institutional and commercial space um, including the Olympic Village uh, Science World and Emily Carr University and that system's expanding out to be uh, 10 megawatts uh, and we're currently delivering five new shark systems to them uh, this year so um, pay attention to that and uh, pay attention to to some of our uh, new projects that are going to be on the go here. Thank you. Camille Saltman, I'm the Chief Marketing and Sustainability Officer for Inca Renew Tech or Inca, Inca Renewable Technologies. Uh, uh, we turn plants into products that sequester carbon and uh, help. Um, prevent plastic waste and preserve the rainforest. Our, our um, expertise is in turning biomass into advanced biocomposites uh, for large industrial customers. Our hemp-based products are a substitute, a direct substitute for glass reinforced plastics and rainforest timber. They're stronger, lighter, less expensive, and far more sustainable. Our team uh, were considered to be leaders in this field, and in fact, recently, we just won the Global JEC Composites Products and Materials Award, uh, which was judged by Mercedes, Airbus, Mitsubishi, and Owens Corning. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, our team has developed four novel patented products for major industrial customers. Our first product is Inca Prepregs. It's a direct substitute for the glass reinforced plastics that the automotive industry uses to manufacture automotive trim components like a door panel or a seat back. Um, our partner, our commercialization partner is Toyota. 
and it's a $7 billion global market. Our second product is Inca Biopanels, and Winnebago Industries is our partner. The RV industry, incredibly, uses 600 million square feet of rainforest plywood each year to build RV sidewalls. And um, obviously not very sustainable and not great as a structure. Uh, they leak all kinds of problems. They, do, they don't last particularly long. They're not very safe. Our large dimension panels provide dimensional stability, unibody construction, and they're much lighter weight, which is really important for the RV industry because they're beginning to manufacture EVs. Next product, Inca BioCore. The cores of wind turbine blades and of marine boats are made of rainforest balsa wood. It's almost exterminated the forests. The quality is terrible. The prices have gone through the roof. And the industry is beginning to substitute petroleum-based foams called PET. Unfortunately, they don't have the compressive strength of balsa wood and they're very expensive, and of course, they're not sustainable. Um, our product is a direct replacement for balsa wood. Our partner is the international uh, company, Gurit, and this is a $40 billion, uh, $40 billion global market. Last product, uh, Inca Bioplastics. Uh, it's a direct replacement for the glass-reinforced plastics that are used to injection mold chairs, tables, Lego blocks, um, single-use um, cutlery, and a whole range of different, uh, different consumer products. Um, our partner is Danimer Scientific, and working with them, they make plant polymers, and we've been able to triple the strength of products and significantly reduce the price. Of course, the... Um, you know, the, the glass reinforced plastics market is huge and they have lots of cost efficiencies because of that. Uh, already the uh, bioplastics market is at 10 billion and it's, it's really rapidly increasing because countries like Canada and regions like the EU are banning single-use plastics. So that's a great, um, uh, that's only going to continue. Uh, our, our ESG uh, metrics, uh, GreenStep actually has done the calculations and the studies for us. And uh, by 2030, uh, we will have captured more than half a million tons of CO2. Our financial uh, projections are very attractive because we're able to uh, purchase waste hemp stock from Canadian farmers who are growing hemp for protein for the seeds uh, for $200 a ton and transform it into advanced biocomposites that sell for over $2,000 a ton. Um, we're building a factory in Alberta uh, where we'll be processing and manufacturing two of the products and we're buying and retooling a factory in Indiana, close to the RV and automotive industries, where we'll be manufacturing the other two. These are tough headwinds in the market right now. Um, we've been fundraising uh, uh, for the last year, uh, our B round, and, but I am delighted to, um, to announce that we recently secured a $10 million emissions reduction Alberta grant uh, from their Circular Economy Challenge, and we also secured a, um, a term sheet uh, with the Canadian dollar uh, versus the U.S. dollar, it now turns out to be 66 million in um, um, uh, Canadian dollars uh, from a New York um, family office. So we're still fundraising in B, but uh, making some good progress. So with that, I'd like to um, turn the mic over to the next speaker, and I'm happy to answer questions uh, after. Thank you so much. I'm Nicole Rustad. I am the Chief Impact Officer of Carbon Counts Tech, and I liken what we're doing to that we are, uh, we've built a platform and we're launching our first mobile game, Everforest, uh, which I'm calling the Candy Crush of Reforestation and Climate Action. 
So um, raise your hand if uh, you've been impacted by smoke or fire or floods in the last five years. Yeah, I, I'm sure everyone can do that. How about if you've used your phone ever for entertainment? Come on, I know everyone's probably played at least Wordled. So there are 8 billion people on this planet. And uh, we've just heard from amazing companies today that are doing great things, innovating, bringing new products uh, to consumers, B2B. And what we recognize is that we need a catalyst to get those 8 billion people on the planet to actually do something because it's going to take all of us to make the difference in climate action. So how do we get everyone to act? Uh, we know that many people just turtle and feel powerless um, to do anything around the climate crisis, yet 64% of people believe that it is something that is mission critical that we act on. They just don't know what to do. We know that gamers care deeply about the environment and social and environmental action. And half of, over half of them are confident they could influence business and others in taking action on climate. We came across uh, something called Ant Forest in China, um, which was launched by Alipay. And it's a game that over 600 million Chinese nationals uh, go to almost every day. And since they've launched that uh, small game, they've planted over 330 million trees uh, in China and uh, inspired uh, echo action through the challenges that they do. Um, so our theory of change is that we believe culture and entertainment can be that catalyst to tip the tide on climate action. And uh, when you look back at things like Live Aid or An Inconvenient Truth, um, we see how those have impacted um, society as a whole in turning the tide on getting people to think otherwise of what, what they can do. Pokemon Go, uh, which some of you may, have any of you played Pokemon Go? Or maybe your kids did? Uh, Pokemon Go, um, they estimate that there were over 144 billion steps taken by people just in the United States. That's like uh, going around the earth, walking around the earth over 2,247 times. And that people that played Pokemon Go in the United States actually increased their physical activity by 26%. That's massive. That's massive social change through gaming. Um, so Carbon Counts Tech and our game Everforest. Uh, we are a play-to-plant adventure. Um, the Everforest is... Um, sort of looks like the, uh, I guess, the Great Bear Rainforest, which some of you may be familiar with. And uh, there's three areas that um, we are really um, hitting hard. One is innovation. We've built a platform for connecting people. Part of our, our reward system in the game is that when people play the game, we are actually reforesting the planet through our partners around the globe. And um, we have a B2B play with that, that um, other companies could launch uh, that play to plant through our platform. And obviously the direct B2C uh, impact with our consumers, the people, the gamers that play the game. Our target market are women, uh, 25 to 45, and uh, it's meant to just play for a few minutes every day. Uh, be, there are echo challenges built into the, the game, and it's a fun first game. Our team has deep experience. Uh, we, uh, I'd say, I, over a third of the team I've worked with for over 15 years. Uh, many of us came from Club Penguin. Some of you may be familiar with that story here. And uh, the Walt Disney Company. Uh, we are a company with uh, our team of 30 people across North America the best people in gaming, the best people in impact. Our, one of our co-founders, Brett Jenks, is the CEO of Rare Conservation, which is a behavior change, uh, climate action charity out of the United States and conservation organization out of the States that has uh, won awards and scaled massively in countries globally to drive climate action. 
Um, our executive producer has, um, was the executive producer of Plants vs. Zombies at EA. Our designer, Cody Vigu, um, he was a designer of uh, Hyper Hippo's hit title, Adventure Capitalist. Uh, Neil and Deanna, um, our head of story, our head of art, um, have had three book deals with Macmillan and come from Disney. All of us have really scaled games, scaled entertainment, and scaled cause marketing initiatives to effect change globally. So uh, we've got an amazing team, and we're just in the middle of doing an extended seed round, uh, raising uh, 2.5 million. If any of you are interested, come and see me. Thank you.